One element of the structure of the book is that it comes in two parts, recovering and retrieving, and then reforming and renewing our eschatology and our ethics. So in part one, we consider what would it mean to retrieve a theocentric hope? Uh, what would it mean to recover that vivid sense of longing for the beatific vision, for being with God in such a profound way that you can speak of face-to-face -face encounter? Uh, and it's crucial because we've forgotten that. In fact, we've mocked it in recent decades in so much eschatological literature as a, a Greek and pagan idea. And I do think we need to recover that witness from those of centuries old. But it's not enough simply to repristinate or to go back. We can't jump to the 4th century or the 12th. We can't jump back to the time of the Reformation, though it's great to remember and celebrate and be thankful for those witnesses in their time. And so, secondly, I, I seek to argue for a way in which we ought to reform that classical eschatology, in which, particularly in, in the Reformed tradition, we've sought to uh, provide a, a more Christ-centered vision of what the beatific hope is, that our vision of God is not some sort of generic beholding of the triune God, but is distinctly mediated by Jesus of Nazareth, by his incarnate form, and that that's crucial to catching the way in which God wants to make himself present to us, not just during his earthly sojourn, but even in our heavenly hope in the, the great eternal life yet to come. Then when we come to retrieving and recovering and renewing our, our ethics, uh, attentive to the witness of saints of old, I think also we do need to retrieve. We need to listen to the past where uh, saints from the patristic era through the Puritan movement uh, focused on the call to be heavenly minded, that we would learn uh, to meditate, to contemplate, to prayerfully uh, desire and pursue a, a thicker spiritual vision of this world by focusing first not on this world but on God's heavenly presence and then secondly on how that is moving into this world. But it's again not enough simply to retrieve and remember. We have to move on to renew and to reform and hopefully to bring that vision itself under uh, the authority of Holy Scripture today. And so I, I also go on to, to speak of how, again in the Reformed tradition, that heavenly-minded focus and the ascetical practice that it leads to has led to a reform of how we think about self-denial. That we want to insist that the kind of ascetical life of discipline and self-denial is first and foremost uh, not simply about us cooking up our own visions like the sort of the the, the dietary or the athletic training approach to, to finding whatever works for you, but rather that we're to follow the protocols of Holy Scripture and we're not to bind the consciences of others with our own uh, habits or inclinations, that uh, spiritual disciplines are actually provided for us in God's Word. He doesn't just give us the goal, but He also gives us the means to pursue it. And so a more scripturally uh, sort of bound set of ascetical practices are crucial, I think. But secondly, we want to see that Scripture also commends the idea that we pursue that kind of discipline, that kind of self-denial, knowing that we're already adopted sons and daughters, knowing that we're already in the divine family. And so we're willing to uh, give up and sacrifice lesser goods for the sake of a joy and a, a belonging that is already ours in Jesus Christ. And so in the Reformation, that great distinction between justification and sanctification is meant to uh, alert us to that reality that our ascetical practice our discipline of following the way of the cross, our willingness to deny ourselves daily, uh, flows from, rather than leads to, our being received and embraced and delighted in by God our Heavenly Father. And so I hope readers will catch that the book not only seeks to commend a vision of what we hope for and how we live in light of it, but also illustrates a way of doing theology. That we, we have to attend to the witness of saints of old as they teach us how to read the full breadth of Scripture, but that it's not enough simply to retrieve or to remember or to do historical work. We have to also, again, ask in what ways does Holy Scripture speak more? In what ways does it further reform that vision? In what ways does it address us today? And so, in each part of the book, I hope it commends not only a, a material claim, but also a formal practice about how we do theology today.